Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today, I'm super excited to share with you a summary of the book, The Price You Pay for College, by Ron Lieber. This book is a game changer for anyone who is about to make one of the biggest financial decisions of their lives. For many high school students, choosing to go to college is the most important decision they'll make. But once that initial choice has been made, a slew of new questions follow. Where to apply? What to study? Which offer to accept? And how to pay for it all? But don't worry, this video is here to help. We'll cover everything from the world of merit aid to the downsides of research-focused schools and show you how to weigh the merits of little-known schools. Plus, you'll learn how you can save for college for the price of a coffee a day. So get ready to make informed decisions with confidence and join me as we dive into the world of college and the price you pay for it. Let's get started. Idea number one. Are you ready to dive into the world of college financing? Because, let me tell you, it's a wild ride. So, you know how everyone always says college is super expensive? Yeah, that's true. I mean, four years at a state university can cost over $100,000, and if you're looking at an elite private college, then we're talking about $300,000. That's a whole lot of money. But here's the thing. Most students don't actually pay the full price. In fact, the key message is that most students pay less than the list price. The list price is just the standard, undiscounted figure you see in college brochures. But the good news is that most students can expect to pay less. We've got need-based financial aid, which is provided by the government and colleges to less well-off families, and then we've got merit aid, which is designed to make a school's offer more attractive. Schools offer merit aid to attract talented students and to make their high list price more affordable for families. And the great news is that these two types of aid can add up. In the 2019-2020 academic year, the average full-time, first-year student attending college for the first time got a discount of 52.6% off the list price of tuition. After discounts, families paid an average of $15,400 for full-time, in-state students, including tuition, room, and board. Private schools, on the other hand, are a bit pricier with an average of $27,400. So, there you have it. Most students pay less than the list price, and the combination of need-based financial aid and merit aid can make a big difference. Now. Isn't that a bit of a relief? Idea number two. If you're looking to finance your college education, you've probably heard of the FAFSA or the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. It's your chance to apply for financial aid from the U.S. government, and with some colleges costing over $80,000 a year, financial aid is not just for low-income families anymore. But here's the thing. The FAFSA has gotten a bit of a bad rap for being confusing and for not always providing the aid that families need. So, let me break it down for you. If you need financial aid, definitely apply for it, but don't have sky-high expectations. The government has a limited budget and uses the FAFSA to calculate an expected family contribution or EFC to decide how much aid to offer. Unfortunately, the EFC can often be higher than what families can afford and the aid offered is less than what they need. Some schools even have their own form, the CSS profile, to determine who deserves their discounts and grants. Bottom line. Don't count on financial aid to be your saving grace. It can help, but it's not always enough. So, make sure to apply, but don't get your hopes up too high. Idea number three. Pick a college that prioritizes teaching and mentorship. At its most fundamental, college is about teaching and learning. Maturing, meeting new friends, and having fun are important, of course. But when parents shell out hundreds of thousands of dollars for their kids' education, they expect them to learn above all else. But there's a problem. Believe it or not, teaching has slipped down the list of educators' priorities in recent years. The reason? An increased emphasis on research. After all, research is what gets professors promotions and tenure. 
It also brings in money and boosts schools' reputations, so college administrators love it too. But encouraging professors to focus on research means directing them away from students. The key message here is, pick a college that prioritizes teaching and mentorship. With professors withdrawing to their labs and offices, the task of teaching undergraduates is increasingly being shouldered by adjuncts and graduate students. Some of these people are capable teachers, but not all of them, and most of them are working in unfavorable circumstances. Adjuncts are often hired on short-term contracts and may have to work at several schools to make ends meet. The precariousness of their positions makes it difficult to form strong bonds with students. Grad students, on the other hand, are often so focused on their studies that they have little time to devote to their undergraduate students. This is a shame because mentorship is of huge importance in shaping students' lives and careers. In 2018, Gallup published groundbreaking research showing that having a mentor is one of the most important factors in determining young adults' life satisfaction. So how can you find out if the schools you're considering encourage teaching and mentorship? Well, first you'll want to check out the websites of the departments you're considering. Scrutinize the titles of the academic staff. Are there lots of professors, and can you find out what classes they teach? Or are there lots of adjuncts, visiting professors, and lecturers? If you can find a school with a high proportion of professors who regularly teach, you've struck gold. If you want to know more about mentorship specifically, just ask. Get in touch with someone at the school and ask if they have any mentorship programs in place. Some schools are even willing to pick up the tab when professors sit down to dinner with students. If you can find a school with a policy like that, you can expect a culture of mentorship and strong bonds between staff and students. Idea number four. It's time to consider the big question of college. What are you actually getting for your money? It's a big decision with a big price tag and big dreams of a successful future. But it's important to think about the ROI of your investment, especially when it comes to your future earnings. So, what do you need to know? Well, you're in luck because the U.S. Department of Education has got you covered with their college scorecard. This is the ultimate guide to what a school has to offer and how it will impact your future earnings. First and foremost, you don't want to spend all that money and time and not even graduate. So, check out the graduation and retention rates on the college scorecard. But remember, the stats aren't the whole story. Some schools might have a lower retention rate because they attract students from disadvantaged backgrounds, but their teaching could still be top-notch. Another important factor to consider is the median salary of a school's graduates. The government only tracks the income of graduates who qualified for federal aid, but it still provides valuable insight into what you can expect post-college. Plus, you can even view the median salary for a particular field of study, so you can weigh the financial implications of each choice. So, while the data isn't perfect, it still gives you a much clearer picture of what your educational investment will bring. Don't just take a shot in the dark. Make informed decisions based on the data available. Idea number five. Are you feeling overwhelmed by all the unfamiliar colleges out there? Fear not, because I've got some tips to help you assess them. When it comes to lesser known colleges, reputation might not always be enough to go by. So, let's do some detective work. Start by checking out the president or chancellor's page on the school's website. Read their speeches and articles to get a sense of their vision and values. And here's the key message. Checking out a few key metrics can make it easier to assess unfamiliar colleges. One of those key metrics is the school's strategic plan. This document lays out their strengths, weaknesses and future plans, and can give you an unvarnished look at what the college has to offer. If the school doesn't have a strategic plan readily available, don't worry there's more info to be found. Next up, check out the financial aid page. Some schools will give you a clear picture of the grades and aptitude scores needed to earn different amounts of merit aid. But if that information is lacking, 
Don't give up just yet. Search for the school's common data set, CDs. The CDs is packed with valuable information that can give you a better understanding of the college. You'll find data on first-year students who applied for need-based financial aid and the average payout they received. You'll also see the number of enrolled students who received merit aid. And don't forget, elsewhere in the CDs you can find the range of test scores achieved by admitted applicants. So, if your own results put you in the top quartile, there's a good chance you'll be awarded some merit aid too. So there you have it. A few key metrics that can make assessing unfamiliar colleges a breeze. Idea number six. Are you feeling overwhelmed by the thought of saving up for your future alma mater? Trust us, we understand how you feel. The cost of college can be daunting, but don't worry, you've got this. The key message we want to share with you today is, aim to save a quarter of the sum you'll need. Think about it like this, you don't need to have all the money saved up before you step foot on campus. In fact, most people use a combination of savings, loans, and current income to pay for college. So, why not aim to save a substantial portion of it? A quarter, to be exact. Financial planner and author Kevin McKinley suggests dividing the total college bill by four and paying one quarter with savings, two quarters with loans, and the final quarter with current income. For example, if the total bill for a student's undergraduate degree is estimated to be $100,000, aim to save $25,000 and use loans and current income to make up the rest. And don't worry, it's not as hard as it seems. If you save $75 a month over 18 years with an annual interest rate of 5%, you'll have $25,000 saved up in no time. And, if you think about it in terms of a monthly sum, it feels much more achievable than any big end goal or price tag. So, what do you say summary? If you're thinking about college, you're probably feeling a mix of excitement and stress about the cost. But guess what? You don't have to break the bank to get a great education. That's right. The sticker price of college might seem high, but with a little research and the right tools, you can find a school that fits your budget. One of the best ways to research colleges is to check out their mentorship programs, graduate salaries, retention rates, and financial aid grants. Trust us, this information can save you a lot of money in the long run. And here's a hot tip for you. Take a look at the Alumni Factor Rankings. This is a super cool way to measure colleges based on their alumni's satisfaction levels. It's the only college survey that is solely based on students' experiences, and you might be surprised at what you find. Who knows, you might discover a hidden gem like Center College in Kentucky. They even made it into the top 10. So don't let the cost of college scare you away from your dreams. Do some research and find a school that's right for you. Now, the insights and knowledge I gained from reading The Price You Pay for College were phenomenal. I highly recommend it. Thank you for taking the time to watch, and if you found value in this video, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel for more great content. Trust me, you won't regret it.